Hello, I'm Rex Childhouse, and because things on the internet seem to lose their date references pretty easy, if I'm not mistaken, today is Wednesday, September 28th, 2022. And uh, this is actually going to be a series of videos about one of the most emotional events that have ever occurred in my life, and uh, it's courtesy of Wish of a Lifetime. ARP, uh, our counselor up there at Wish of a Lifetime, Regine, uh, and it it uh, takes me back to uh, an individual that I have an incredible amount of respect for, and the more I learn about him, the, the more I respect him, uh, my dad. So, trying to figure out when, if I were to write a book about this, uh, when I, where, how I would start this, I, and I've written a lot of books, I'm published, um, tech, college textbooks, uh, when you're teaching procedures, it's easy, uh, when you're teaching, when you're writing life events, uh, I found out it's not quite so easy. My dad was born in 1922, he was in the United States Army before Pearl Harbor was bombed, uh, he was in the United States Army after uh, victory in Japan Day. He got out in 1945. So he was in the Army, U.S. Army, before World War II, during World War II, and after World War II. He served in the Aleutian Islands uh, and fought in the Battle of Midway when the Japanese occupied places like Shimia, Attu, Dutch Harbor. Uh, he talked about them occasionally. Um, it was kind of interesting. Uh, he joined the uh, parachute, parachute uh, paratroopers, uh, 101st Airborne Division after that, and uh, would occasionally talk about uh, his experiences in Europe. And it would, go, it would go like this, and it was during the Vietnam era, and I was born in 1951. My parents uh, were married in 1946, if I remember the dates uh, correctly. Uh, a relative, a uh, fellow church member, uh, a friend, acquaintance uh, would be hurt, injured, killed in Vietnam. My dad would be sitting at the dining room table, would get uh, that look in his eye and uh, would look at me and say, we've got to go out to the garden and pull weeds. Uh, the garden was his haven. Um, when you watched him in the garden, you realized that there was something draining from his body and whatever it was, it probably wasn't good, it really needed to be out. And when he would uh, say something like, let's go out to the garden and talk or something like that, you, you generally knew it was going to be a one-way conversation. He was going to be talking and he really didn't want you to talk. And uh, the conversations were usually about a place that I kind of knew about uh, and I would learn a lot more about called Bastogne. Now, Dad... And, and the issue we have with my dad, uh, number one, he died in 1984, so asking him questions now is just a little bit too late. That's issue number one. Issue number two is his service record was destroyed in the uh, National Archives fire of St. Louis, Missouri, 1973. So we have about four pieces of paper associated with his military service. We have a separation from service. Uh, people who were separated in 1945 do not get a DD-214. That's the Department of Defense Form 214. And uh, considering the Department of Defense wasn't created until 1947, people who separated from military service in 45 didn't get a DD-4. So we have a separation from service. It's water damaged. It's blurry. Um, it's hard to read. You can't read it exact. Uh, Dad would often say that it was wrong. His, his DD-24, his uh, separation from service was wrong. Uh, he could never get it corrected. He just gave up on it. Uh, he was a disabled vet uh, and, and uh, had issues with that. During World War I, if I'm not mistaken, they call it shell shock. Uh, during World War II, they called it combat fatigue. Sometime after World War II, and I don't know what they called it in Korea, uh, Vietnam, whatever it became, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, an issue I would learn a lot about and I have issues with every night because of my military career. So my dad would 
retreat to the garden uh, take me along uh, for some reason I want to say my dad talked to me a lot um, when I was sick as a youngster my dad spent a lot of time in the hospital with me changed jobs so he could visit me more often so uh, in years later uh, I would figure out that uh, for some reason my dad had some pretty significant ties to me for whatever reasons and I would learn about those. Uh, Dad talked about jumping in into uh, Normandy on D-Day. Uh, said something like uh, he landed in a puddle or a lake or a pond or a river, didn't know what it was, uh, lost all of his gear if he hadn't been a strong swimmer, which is one of the reasons why he stressed that all of his children learned how to swim. He would have drowned. So I uh, ended up in, in Normandy on the D-Day invasion uh, pretty much without anything because of where he landed in his parachute, 101st Airborne Division. Talked about Operation Market, and it's not Operation Market Gardens, it's Operation Market and Operation Garden. Operation Market was to jump into uh, the Netherlands, and uh, that was the air operation. Operation Garden was to drive through Netherlands, the ground operation, uh, one of General Montgomery's uh, disasters, failures, and do not mention Montgomery to my dad if you ever meet him in heaven. My dad hated Montgomery. A uh, number of, of Americans who were knowledgeable about World War II, participated in World War II, hated Montgomery. Uh, everything the Americans did was wrong, according to General Montgomery. Everything he did was right, and yet he has no real accomplishments other than El Alamein. Everything else was... Uh, was a disaster and everything he planned was a disaster but he took credit for a lot of other successes so don't ever mention Montgomery if you ever meet my dad in heaven my dad uh, would say that uh, he knew that his grandfather uh, migrated from the Netherlands and uh, because of the way the action occurred in the Netherlands he never got to talk to anybody whatever else uh, so he was in the home of his his ancestors and uh, nothing happened. Bastogne, Belgium, Battle of the Bulge was a different issue. Dad would talk about uh, Bastogne more than any other subject uh, of World War II and it was usually a one-way conversation. If I asked a question it frequently got ignored. Uh, sometimes it didn't but it usually got ignored. And Dad would make statements like, uh, we were sent up there out of a rest and recovery camp, which I think is pronounced Malcom, France. And uh, because we had turned in all of our gear after Operation Market, uh, we were in summer uniforms without our weapons, whatever else, because they're all off being cleaned, repaired, uh, whatever. And then they were ordered to move out immediately because of the Battle of Bulge, December 1941, uh, 1944, which was actually the largest military operation on mainland Europe, uh, Western Europe during World War II because of everybody involved. Hitler's last push. And uh, he said uh, the 101st Airborne was sent up without uh, proper gear, uh, being clothes, weapons, food, everything else, uh, because everything was happening so fast and it was so chaotic uh, and it was respond do something go so they get up to Bastogne uh, which was not their original destination you have to read things like uh, Rendezvous with Destiny uh, super book uh, Band of Brothers another really good book beyond Band of Brothers uh, super book also uh, to understand what was happening get an idea of the degree of chaos uh, that was occurring at the at the uh, time the Germans tried to push through to uh, uh, forget the name of the port anyways uh, they wanted to Antwerp they wanted to get to Antwerp so the 101st Airborne ends up in uh, Bastogne Belgium and when I say the 101st Airborne I really mean the allies that were encircled uh, by the Germans in Bastogne because it wasn't just the 101st there were numerous other um, allied units in there. Some books will allude to uh, a small group of actual Belgian soldiers that were there as well. So if I say 101st in, in Bastogne, it's actually allies, uh, not just 101st. My dad would say 
the 101st was sent up there uh, without the proper gear, uh, top to bottom. Uh, no winter clothing, no weapons, or limited winter clothes and limited weapons, whatever. And uh, and it was cold. It was, according to some references, it was the coldest winter in 70 years. So they get up to Bastogne, Belgium, and uh, the battle's going on. At that time, they were not encircled. And uh, later, they would become encircled. And uh, the citizens of Bastogne, and this is where it got my dad, and this is where it gets me. The citizens of Bastogne uh, were also in a very similar predicament because now war is raging around their house, their uh, town, their town, and, and it wasn't just the city, it was an area, it was about 100 square miles, about a 10 by 10, and it wasn't a square, but it was, it, encirclement is a good description, but it's about 100 square miles. Uh, well, the Allies uh, and the 101st are fighting off the Germans, trying to protect Bastogne because it was a crossroads uh, community, and if they got, if the Germans took control, then they could advance rapidly. Uh, Bastogne is a rolling agricultural, uh, for heavily forest area, not really good for tanks uh, or trucks off the roads, and the roads weren't that strong in the first place. So a lot of reasons why they wanted Bastogne, uh, besides Eagle, and that was one of them. So this is emotional. Uh, the 101st gets sent in. Uh, they take control of the area. As I said, they've got control of other Allied units as well. And uh, my dad would say things like, the civilians were cold because of the temperature or whatever else. The Allies were cold because of the temperature and the civilians were bringing their clothes and their blankets to the Allies to keep the Allies warm. Because food stocks were limited, uh, the civilians were hungry, and yet at the same time the civilians of Bastogne were bringing hot food and whatever food they could spare uh, to the Allies to feed them because the Allies were short of food as well. When the Allies were suffering from the two medical issues that really hampered them, which were trench foot and frostbite, uh, the locals were bringing them into their homes and getting them warm and trying to help them out. When the Allies were injured, meaning gunshot, broken arms, whatever else, uh, combat injuries, uh, the, the civilians of Bastogne were taking them into their homes, putting them in their own beds. They were sleeping on the floor, taking care of the Allies. And the reason was the civilians of Bastogne knew that if the Germans retook Bastogne, retaliation would be severe. So uh, the citizens said, we're, we're not going back under German occupation again, and we will do everything possible to keep them out of here, and the way we do that is support the Allies, which they did, and a uh, really emotional issue. So uh, the citizens also knew that there were collaborators in the group, in the town. Uh, they identified some of them, and those collaborators were isolated. Uh, as quickly as possible, kept away from communications line, but they also knew that there were collaborators that they didn't know and anything they did inside could be told to the Germans. He said that the locals also ran messages, ran supplies, um, let the Allies know where snipers were hiding in trees, uh, where snipers were, were, were Allied for, where German forces were moving because they had communications through this, through through the lines to relatives outside the, the uh, immediate area of Bastogne. So Dad said that he always wanted to go back to Bastogne and thank the civilians uh, for their support during World War II. And uh, that was the one place uh, out of mainland Europe that he wanted to go back to. He said that Austria was some of the most beautiful country he'd ever seen. He loved Bastogne. Uh, didn't didn't speak a whole lot about uh, much else of mainland Europe. Uh, did say he wanted to go back to the United Kingdom, being Scotland, Ireland, England, 
uh, possibly Wales, uh, to see it again uh, because that's where they trained and they sat for, for a while waiting for D-Day. So Dad always said that he wanted to go back to Bastogne and thank the civilians uh, for their support during Battle of the Bulge. Well, he died in 1984. I, the, the more I learned about my dad growing up and uh, the more I've learned about my dad my entire lifetime, uh, the more respect I have for him. He was a math wizard. He could tell you what uh, 364 was in decimals and if you wanted to expand that by 5%, uh, he could probably do that in his mind. He taught me trigonometry. Uh, he taught me a lot of things. So. My dad uh, was later wounded in Alsace, France. Uh, we have the uh, hospital induction record, which is kind of confusing. It says broken arm, and it says he was in the hospital for 71 days. Doesn't seem right. Uh, he disagreed with that. Had a pretty good scar on his back from it. Uh, how do you get a scar on your back from a broken arm? Kind of, kind of interesting. So. Things that happened during my life before the event that is the prime subject of this video series, and this is going to be a series. Uh, I get accepted in Southern Illinois University, Aviation Technology, Carbondale, Illinois. Uh, my dad comes down to see us. I take him out to the airport where I'm going to school, and there's a couple of C-47s and a DC-3. The difference between a DC-3 and a C-47 is the DC-3 has a small passenger door, a C-47 has a big cargo door with a small passenger door inside of it. My dad, as a member of the 101st, jumped out of a lot of C-47s. So we go over and we uh, tour the C-47s and uh, to see the emotional impact of my dad walking into those airplanes. Uh, a couple of them that were off to the a to the uh, aviation maintenance side, which is where I was going to school, are still set up as troop transports. So they have the row seats along the sides of the cabin, not passenger seats. Uh, he walked in, sat down, uh, and, and and to watch the emotions uh, go through my dad, sitting in a C-47, which he jumped out of numerous times. Uh, walked up to the cockpit. Uh, he said he was the last guy out in the stick. He was the stick sergeant. He made sure everybody in front of him got out one way or another. So he said his position normally was sitting right behind the cockpit so he could watch all the pilots uh, and, and flight engineers, navigators, whatever, do their thing. And now he got to, uh, to sit there again. Uh, we walked over to look at the uh, See, we, the school operated one C-47 converted to a passenger plane and one DC-3, which was always a passenger plane. And uh, while we were doing that, one of the pilots for the DC-3 or C-47 series came out and my dad was talking to him about flying the, uh, in this C-47 and whatever. And to watch uh, my dad and this guy talk, and this guy never flew the C-47 in combat, uh, much younger. A Vietnam era guy, Air Force guy, uh, to watch the two of them talk and my dad tell him about being in the C-47, being shot at, whatever else, combat jumps training, uh, was interesting. Something else. While I was stationed in Kingsville, Texas, uh, my dad comes down to see us again. Uh, I was a jet instructor in Kingsville. And uh, we go down to the then Comer uh, Con Confederate Air Force Museum in Harlingen. It's now called the Commemorative Air Force. Political issues there. And we're touring their facilities, and there's a couple of C-47s there, still set up as troop transports. And they were working on them, and uh, my dad walks up, starts talking to one of the mechanics. One of the mechanics is a World War II uh, flight engineer, I think he said he was. Uh, it was a long time ago. And uh, they got into a discussion, and um, for close to an hour, um, the two of them just talked about World War II, and I kind of stood off on the peripheral, uh, let them talk and, and listen to them talk about uh, what was happening. And uh, the guy said that he uh, flew a lot of jumpers. Uh, 
I think he said he was 82nd Airborne, which my dad giggled at because of a lot of uh, issues between the 82nd and 101st. Anyways, uh, my dad talked to the guy for probably over an hour. Uh, my wife, my mother, uh, my daughters uh, drifted off elsewhere. I kind of played tag between my dad, this guy, and them and got some photos of the museum, but uh, my dad just wanted to talk to this guy and it was an interesting conversation. So, from interactions, we know uh, a lot, we know things about my dad's military events. Uh, we can't prove them because his records were destroyed. Well, he died in 1984, so we can't ask him questions. March 2022 time frame, uh, Russia, Putin, uh, invades the Ukraine. Now, if you're a history fan, Stalin, Joseph Stalin, Stalin was not his birth name. Stalin is actually Man of Steel of Russian. Stalin is a Ukrainian. So there's a lot of issues why Putin wants to take the Ukraine back into Russia. So, March 2022 time frame, Putin invades the Ukraine. Uh, I'm thinking about my dad. I uh, think about him a lot. I'm doing woodworking. I'm back in the leatherworking, which he did. He was an excellent woodworker. Uh, and I'm, I'm trying to live the life my dad lived, I guess. So, Russia invades the Ukraine. Uh, it's on the news, and one of the news clips is... A civilian comes running out from between two houses, throws a Molotov cocktail at a piece of Russian tracked armor. Now, uh, first of all, the Russians have a concept of building their military. They'd rather have a lot of good stuff than a little bit of really good stuff. We go the other way. We'd, have a, we'd rather have a little bit of really good stuff than a lot of good stuff. But uh, this is kind of ironic. A weapon devised, developed by a guy who would become General Molotov, uh, a Russian, uh, used, uh, designed to uh, beat the Germans during World War II, is now being used against them in the Ukraine. I kind of giggle and laugh at that. Uh, it's kind of ironic. But it has me thinking about my dad again uh, and the civilians that supported them in Bastogne, which was his most common subject about World War II. And uh, a couple of days later, I get an email from AARP, which has a link to Wish of a Lifetime. And it says, basically, if you have a wish of a lifetime, uh, please fill out the blank. Please fill out the form. Well, first of all, and, and anything that I say in this series that's negative is not negative because of Wish of a Lifetime, AARP, Regine, uh, most of it's negative because we played ugly American and did something stupid. Uh, I normally do not fill out those things. Uh, I consider them usually to be, we just want your email for send you more ads and, and whatever else. I consider AARP uh, and Wish of a Lifetime because I researched them to be credible. But I'm thinking about my dad. It had been a bad night, uh, PTSD nightmares, whatever else. And uh, I, I just I just open up the link to Wish of a Lifetime and uh, start typing. And, and I really enter my dad's wish. And uh, I, to, to go back to Bastogne and thank the civilians for their support during World War II and the Battle of the Bulge. And I put down there that uh, since he died in 1984, maybe I'd like to do it. And it was just a dumping. I expected absolutely nothing. It was just one of those, uh, you kind of have to do it because you have to do a thing. And it was kind of done as uh, another testament to my dad. So, submit it. A couple of days later, I get a call from Wish of a Lifetime, Raji, who would be our counselor on this. And uh, she sets up an interview, and I think she said it was uh, 10, 15, 15, 20 minutes long for the first time. Uh, that's fine. I'm not only retired, I'm tired. 
Um, not, so as long as it doesn't interfere with doctor's appointments or Disneyland runs or whatever, I'm. what else am I doing? So we set up a time and uh, she calls back uh, for the interview. And uh, I think the interview lasted about 90 minutes, maybe a little longer. And she kept asking, do you have time? Yeah, I have time. I'm not only retired, I'm tired. Yeah, whatever. So we chat for a long time. I can't tell you exactly how long. And, uh, and then she calls back a couple of days later. And she says, uh, we'd like to do an interview, a video interview with you and your wife. Well, um, I'm a Samsung guy. Um, I'm having problems doing video things on my phone because I don't understand it. Not because of the phone, because I don't understand it. Try to do video uh, links with my uh, VA mental health team and they fail. So uh, Joyce has a smart uh, an iPhone. She knows how to do that stuff. So we set it up with Joyce's phone. Uh, Rajin calls back at the appointed time. We uh, do the introductions and whatever else. And uh, about two, three minutes into the call, uh, Rajin says, um, I took your wish to the board and we're sending you and your wife to Bastogne, Belgium. I have goosebumps right now. Uh, I was stunned, silent, um, and that's unusual for me. I, I had tears. Um, I was going to get to address my dad's wish. And uh, that was my primary thought. I was going to get to address my dad's wish. If you were to ask me five of the most emotional events in my life, this would be one of them. So. It was originally scheduled for July 2022, airlines, COVID, whatever, it shifted to August 2022 because of COVID, because of uh, airlines, uh, weather, whatever else, it shifted to September and we finally made it in September. So um, So I, I got to complete my dad's wish. And, and to say it's emotional is something else. Um, to see my wife's response, because uh, as my mother would say, um, when you got married, we didn't gain a daughter-in-law, we gained another daughter. My dad felt the same way, and he said that several times. Um, we, I got to carry out my dad's wish. And uh, this series of videos, this is the intro, who my dad was, uh, where we ended up, how we ended up there. So um, I, I'm, I'm going to make a series of videos to follow this one. So this one will probably be something like wish a lifetime number one, then wish a lifetime number two, three, four, uh, as we go through this trip. Talking with Rajin, uh, she set up a trip that was phenomenal, uh, far better than I could have ever done myself, and we're going to take it up to you. We're, we're going to take it to you. Uh, one of the things we did uh, was we did the, and I'm flipping through my itinerary here to read the correct titles, um, the Royal Museum of Army and Military in Brussels, Belgium. What a museum. Uh, I'm going to take you there. Then the Bastogne War Museum in Bastogne, just outside of Bastogne. Then a tour of the battlefield uh, with a guide, um, which was unbelievable. Uh, then we did the 101st Airborne Museum, which is in Bastogne itself. We visited the uh, General McAuliffe uh, Memorial several times, uh, General Patton Memorial several times because it was near the hotel. Uh, then we did the uh, Bastogne Barracks, which was phenomenal, and, uh, and then headed back. We were going to do the zoo in Brussels, and at this point my wife and I were, and my wife called it quits. She said, I am beat, I'm dog tired, we've done a lot of walking, 
and uh, I was emotionally burned out. Uh, so we went back to Brussels uh, the day before we got on the airplane to come home. And we got into the hotel, we canceled the zoo option, uh, the zoo trip, uh, which I'm very thankful we did. I wish we'd done it, but I'm glad we didn't do it because we were dog tired. Uh, um, I w we were emotionally burned out. We crashed in the hotel uh, back in Brussels uh, the day before we got on the airplane to come home. And then the trip home took 27 plus hours. So to say thanks to Wish of a Lifetime, AARP, and Rajin, and the people of Bastogne, Belgium. Uh, unbelievable. Um, and what that town still thinks of the 101st Airborne, and we're gonna show it to you, I'm gonna show it to you. What the town thinks of the 101st Airborne Division and the allies uh, that defended the town during the Battle of the Bulge, uh, they still remember. A number of the people that I talked to and told thanks uh, and, and told them why we were there uh, were very appreciative and were very knowledgeable about it. Some of them weren't. So uh, this concludes uh, video number one. It's emotional for me. And uh, videos two, three, four, five will have specific subjects like a, uh, uh, the Royal Museum of Army and military, whatever it was. Uh, I'll take you through those because they were phenomenal things. This was truly a wish of a lifetime and it ended up being three wishes. My dad's wish, go back to Belgium, uh, go back to Bastogne, thank the civilians. He can't do that, he died. I got a wish to complete his wish, which was really, it's emotional um, to, a, to a degree that's undefinable. But third, a wish came up that I had not stated, and uh, my wife just retired from being a school teacher for 18 plus years, been with school district for like 34. Uh, emotional event for her, she's trying to figure out where her feet are on the ground. Uh, I retired several, four years ago or so from uh, teaching community college and pretty much building toys now and, and woodworking and doing leather work and whatever else. Bastogne put us back, this trip put us back in an environment where we were distracted by nothing else other than each other and the things we were doing. Making a lot of mistakes, getting mad, getting frustrated, whatever, because we were doing stupid things. But we talked a lot, we spent a lot of time together. Uh, I got to date my wife again. And my third wish, I didn't even realize it. It was rainy, we were soaking wet, we were having fun, and I got to date my wife again. And it was fun. And I got to, I got to, to see why my dad held Bastogne in the place he held it in his heart and his life and uh, unbelievable. I did three um, what's called um, I, I'm, I'm stuck I, I'm, I did three hostile fire zones as the Navy phrases them and one combat zone during my career Quite honestly, I don't want to go back to any of them. My dad always wanted to go back to Bastogne. Uh, I understand why. Um, and it had benefits that were unbelievable, um, truly emotional. So I'm gonna end this one um, because I'm crying. Uh, my nose is starting to run. Uh, I'm gonna end this one. There'll be others and I'm just gonna mark them sequentially and I'll take you through the place we went through. And, and I, there is no way I can say thank you enough to Wish of a Lifetime, AARP, and Rajin for setting this up. And uh, thanks to my dad and the people at Bastogne. If my dad had not survived World War II, I wouldn't be here. That's pretty obvious. And uh, I learned a whole lot more about my dad. And I respected my dad before this. I have a whole lot more respect for him now. So thank you to everybody who 
was responsible for granting not one wish, not two, but three. Thank you. Moving on to the next video.